as we consider this COVID-19 situation, we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to not be part of the problem? Uh, this, this call to arms to flatten the curve, I think, is a good one. And I think all of us have a responsibility to do the right thing, right? So that doesn't mean we, you know, go into our basements and dig an extra level deep and, you know, live off of crackers for the next uh, six months. But it does mean we should be pragmatic. Uh, oh, boy, those... I'm telling you, the endorphins are hitting it high there, Andy. Thanks, buddy. Um, the point is, we each can take steps to deal with this COVID-19, uh, COVID-13, whatever it is. Yeah, by the way, if you want to get in here and jump in, uh, we've got the uh, Zoom, and you're welcome to join and, and talk it through. We're going to have just a little discussion. I, uh, I know that India, uh, Margaret points out, India canceled all foreign visas basically for the next month, and I think that will extend, by the way. So, uh, unfortunately, that India trip's postponed. So, all of my travel just got whacked. Um, uh, Vegas, India, uh, even going to Germany, um, and probably London as well. All of that is completely uh, backed up. Uh, hey, Liran, I see you. Uh, Kasi, Hello. How are you, buddy? Doing well, thank you. So, if you guys are watching on Facebook Live, you see the little link in Zoom. You can jump on. We'll have a conversation. We can have, I think, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 people on the screen at once. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Leron? I'll try to make sure that they can hear you, but uh, I don't know how, how well the audio will transition. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I saw, I saw you were on Facebook, so I jumped over. Um, my thoughts are kind of kind of the same. Um, you know, I, we were supposed to, I, I was supposed to speak at TNC and have a booth, and I canceled that today. Uh, I was supposed to go to Florida this weekend for business and also make it a family weekend, and I canceled that today. Yes. So, but I'm not panicking, but I'm also trying, like you said, not to be part of the problem. I yeah. know that, that if I do get it, then likely I'll get over it. Um, but at the same time, I'm trying to just to be smart, but at the same time, I'm not panicking. The world's not going to hell. Um, just trying to focus. And I'm also trying to focus, like, I see some people, I'm in some chat groups on messenger, mm -hmm. um, and people are like all day with headlines all day, all day, all day with like back and forth and I'm really trying not to waste a lot of my time on this corona thing I'm trying to really focus and work and uh, work out and meditate and spend time working on my business and spend time with my family and yes I'm watching the news and watching what's going on but I'm, I'm also trying not to make this a you know major focal point of my entire life which I feel like it's very easy to get caught into the drama and to shift your focus into this versus really like what are you trying to what are you trying to do with your life I think that's a very good point. Um, so for those on Facebook, if you want to jump into the link I put in the Facebook Live, you can jump onto the Zoom with us. You can see each other. We've got, uh, I got secret stuff on my whiteboard, so that's why I got my green screen uh, blocking the, some of the secret stuff I have cooking. Uh, but I, I think your approach is uh, pragmatic there, uh, Liron. The, the, the point for us all is what steps we need to take, what should we really be focused on? And I'll, I'll tell you, the honest truth is, there's going to be a heck of a lot of changes behaviorally in the supply side and the demand side of this situation. And that means each of us need to take a, um, a very clear look at our business and figure out what that means in very practical terms. Like, can we get the stuff we want to sell? Will people buy that stuff? Um, you know, maybe you're planning on making a big order for uh, Prime Day or something. Is Prime Day still going to be as big as it was, or will it be the biggest ever because everybody's being, you know, kind of feels more comfortable online? So there's a lot of upsides here, but there's also some risks, and I, I highly encourage people to, to uh, be aware of those risks. Uh, Rollins, by the way, you're on the uh, Zoom, and we're, uh, we can see your Gmail there. You're sharing your screen there. So uh, I, I don't know if that's intentional or not, but uh, unless you want everybody reading your email, I would take that off. So. Uh, a couple key things to talk about. So, you know, one of the things that I think, and Liron, I love your opinion, is what do you think about the, the China response to the virus? Uh, what's your opinion about how all that went? And, and, you know, it's been a good two months in China. What, what's your thoughts? I mean, I just had a conversation with one of my suppliers tonight, actually, right before this. Um, and I have an order that will be complete March 20th and is getting ready to ship that. And it's in the, uh, Jiangsu region. And he said, Hey, here, everything is good. Um, so to me, it sounds like China took some early drastic measures, which seem to have been effective, right? They closed off streets. They didn't let people 
leave only you know you can you have to have a mask on to go to your you know with with a with a person to go do your food shopping and whatever but i think it seemed to be effective in, in dealing with it. and i think they were just in the last few days i saw that they were the amount of new cases was actually declining um i think and it seems to be you know coming to some kind of balance there so it sounds to me like china took some early drastic measures that in hindsight we probably should have taken here uh but didn't and it seems like now we're you know now the president is really like you know tonight canceling canceling flights to europe and starting to take the drastic measures that maybe should have been taken um you know back a few weeks ago but um it sounds to me like china has done a pretty good job uh of dealing with this yeah i don't know if, I don't know if you have the same thoughts well, I, I'm, I share some thoughts, but Roland's jump in here, and uh, Roland says, you know, more or less, he feels that China's probably not telling us the truth and getting package responses. That's there, there's some truth to that, Roland. So, uh, without question, everybody's on the party line in China, and you know, you'll hear the exact same text if you talk to suppliers across the nation. Things are getting better. Everything's fine. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, but the, nobody can deny that they have responded in very significant ways to this thing. But the truth is, before they locked down Wuhan, they're like, hey, uh, Friday we're going to lock down Wuhan, and 10 million people left Wuhan. So the idea that this is uh, contained may be still a little premature. I certainly don't know any, any better than anybody else, but there's a high probability of a second um, outbreak there in China. And, and I will just predict this. This is a, a free prediction, uh, no charge for this, uh, that this is going to be – They'll be blaming that on the outsiders, the foreigners. Uh, hey, Kevin, how are you there? Good to see you. And the, the point being that China will look at um, this as a situation to... They'll be blaming that on the outsiders, the foreigners. Hey, there's Margaret, maybe? There you go, yeah. Uh, so let's see. If I'm, if I'm getting a echo, I'm going to just mute you for a minute, and then I'll let you jump in here in a minute. But... So China made some, I think, very impressive, if not draconian measures. That'll be very hard to duplicate in the United States, let's be honest. Uh, uh, I think most people would prefer to, uh, uh, what, what's the New Hampshire model or something? Uh, uh, they'd rather live free than or die or something like that. Uh, so it may be very literal here in the near future. But I do think that, um, you know, it will be hard for America to pull off the same kind of draconian measures. It, Although, do, do you think, I mean, I think people are now starting to take this seriously in America, whereas two weeks ago, you know, wasn't, wasn't really, you know, now that there's a thousand cases and now that you hear people in your local town that are getting it and I see my local Facebook groups, my daughter's school was clean today because there was a parent who was there over the weekend who was tested positive and yeah. I feel like people are going to take the action now. Well, the, the truth is there hasn't been testing in America yet to really know how many cases. And that's, right. you know, it is whatever it is. Uh, but people are taking it more seriously. You're quite right about that. And I think that people take appropriate measures. That's, that's kind of the point of this conversation. So one, uh, like you, Liron, I've suspended all of my travel. Like I had, I was going to Vegas this weekend, and then uh, a couple weeks from then, I was going to go over to India, and then a couple weeks uh, hence, I was going to Germany, London, Serbia, uh, blah, 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 and all of that right now is canceled. Again, not because I'm personally fearful of catching the virus or, or the consequences, although those, there's some uh, people that will be affected by that. It's just because I don't want to be a carrier, an unwitting carrier. You can be asymptomatic, meaning you don't know that you got it and you pass it around to people. And I saw a study out of China where they literally, they tracked these, the buses have uh, cameras in them, and they tracked somebody who had the virus, and then all the people on that bus he gave it to, which were very far away, like in the front of the bus, and then he got on a shuttle bus and passed it on. He passed it to 17 people. And again, not intentionally. He didn't know he was, uh, right. maybe he was, had some symptoms, but this is before the knowledge. So, Long story short, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be part of the problem. And so, you know, we should prepare for a big, huge surge in cases. And I'm talking about 10 times, 100 times uh, what we have now, maybe 1,000 times what we have now. And I, for those who haven't watched, I think the um, 
Andy, Andy shared the Joe Rogan. Did you see that one? Yes. Uh, yes, I did see it. And then if you want the quick version, um, the same guy who was on it, forget his name, but you can look at the most recent like Joe Rogan episodes. Google his name. There's a CNN interview with him also where you can actually read. Rich, I don't have to watch like the hour and a half Joe Rogan. You yeah. can actually read a, a written interview with him. Michael um, Ostrom, Osterholm yeah. is the guy's name. And yeah. you said that's on which, what channel? Um, so there's jo there's Joe Rogan, you know, podcast episode with him. It's like an hour and a half, but there's yeah. also a CNN interview that you can actually read with him, okay. uh, which you can get through information faster. He wrote a book yeah. uh, years back that kind of predicted all this. Yeah, uh, including the origin in China. Hilarious. Yes. Um, and, you know, no, nothing was done about it, of course, because there was no threat, right? So no, no action was taken, but he kind of predicted it. He predicts a lot more people will 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 get it um yeah he predicted 48 million will get it and 480,000 will die roughly and now he wasn't clear in my mind if that was the u.s only some people have told me that's what they think versus if that's a global number uh but he's the expert i'm not the expert but i think he was very uh very pragmatic in his view so let's let's see uh who we got here on the line uh raise your hand so kevin so my eyes I, now are very terrible. So I think part of the, Margaret, part of the, hang on, uh, let me just unmute you there. Hang on, Lee Ron. How are you, Steve? Okay, there you are. Yeah, how are you? Good. How are you? It's all right. Kevin's Kevin's going to golf, and I'm I'm taking over. <laughs> okay, good. Well, so we've yeah. got uh, India sourcing trip. I'm yeah, Margaret. it's Margaret Jolly, right? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, yeah so unfortunately. Well, Megala made a call yesterday that we weren't going to proceed with the trip and we started organising some virtual training as of this morning. So we're trying to do some India sourcing virtually for the next six months and because uh, everyone's just moved over to the next trip in yeah. October. So um, a, it's a bit it of a shame. It is a shame, but I think it's a responsible thing to do. Uh, Jamie uh, points out that he's surprised that ASD hasn't cancelled yet. I'm a bit surprised about that too. Um, but... Uh, talking a, a little bit about the India sourcing trip, you know, that, that decision got made for you guys, right? Because once well, everybody's right. visas were canceled, that's it. I, like, I was going to apply for a visa and get the visa, which I still had plenty of time to do, but they're not going to issue any visas. So no, India is basically like nobody's going in, nobody's going out. No, and I think like the trip organisers won't have – I think they were holding off today was their deadline to make an official announcement, but um, it's pointless now because – it, you know, visas aren't opening till the 15th, so there's not going to be anybody going. So I think it'll have to be cancelled. We haven't actually seen that announcement as yet, but um, it'll have no, no doubt happen today. Yeah, well, with, uh, there's also a high probability that these types of things will be extended, right? I think it's, it's prudent. Uh, so JB points out $22.5 million um, with ASD tied up in whatever sponsorships, etc. Uh, I get that, uh, JB, and, and the, the, one of the things is insurance companies are wiping their hands of everything. They're like, force majeure, I'm out. And so this is a, a critical situation, which is one of the reasons why various countries are providing you know, loans and other things uh, on an emergency basis uh, to help Steve, people. What, what do you think, uh, you know, Canton Fair says uh, it's on, yeah. according to the website. I mean, <laughs> who is going to be attending? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not going to Canton Fair. There's not a chance. And I announced that in mid-January. Uh, right. And notwithstanding the progress in China, and, and I'm still somewhat skeptical on, on the entire and, side. And so many people being in one place. I mean. The rest of the world. Yeah, it's, it's not me. How about, uh, Margaret, are you going? No, well, look, even in Australia, I mean, we've cancelled. They're saying our football games, there's going to be no right. crowd. It's just going to be on the TV. Our Anzac Day, we have 25th of April here. We do a huge Anzac Day dawn service. All that's going to be just on the television. First time since the war. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's major. So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, we've still got Retail Global is supposed to be on the Gold Coast yeah. in 20th of May. I, don't, I can't see that now going ahead either because... Um, if everything else is cancelled, you're just not going to get the people attending. But, I mean, it's very hard for everyone because, you know, so people want to go to the suppliers and, and buy the next lot of stock. It's just a revolving, um, you know, thing. So we're trying to 
um, guide our people through just by, you know, sourcing agents and our knowledge and, you know, supplies yeah. we've already made in India to, to get the people that have booked on the trip, hopefully some products live before we hit you know, the ground in October. So um, at least if they can find, you know, one or two products, they'll be on the way to having something for Christmas because, you know, October, you're not going to get anything going, yeah. you know, for yeah. this year for Q4. October so. is, is, I mean, you know, really July, you should have your, your maybe August uh, last case, but you should have your Christmas locked in. So let's talk about some of this stuff in a pragmatic way. Uh, first of all, Leron, are you go, planning on going to Canton? Absolutely not. Yeah, me neither. So um, the fact is, even if Canton goes, the, the you know, SARS took the, the um, uh, Canton um, attendance down by half. This will be far worse. Uh, airline travel in China is down 80%. Uh, this will only continue. And even those who make it, it's just like re-instigating the Petri dish. So I, I don't think it's a good choice for them to, to continue on with it. Um, so for people with supply chains, as Margaret just talked about, you've got to find local people who can get the job done for you. And I'll give you an example. So my Salmon Global uh, people, the, my China team, they are actively running around to factories that I have, you know, with hundreds of containers in production and trying to make sure we get those things out. But in some cases, each city requires a health certificate. So if they live in Shanghai and they're trying to go to, you know, I don't know, pick your, pick your Luan, China, and there's not a, they don't have a health certificate, they can't cross without doing a 14-day isolation and then a 14-day back. So wow. some of my people have multiple cities, four or five, six cities health certificates. But where we can't get that, we're using a, uh, a nationwide China third-party inspection company to go get eyes on products, go get eyes on raw materials. And I'll give a few tips on how everybody should be doing that. Let me just see here. I got a couple of comments. Uh, Ralph asks, uh, if we lock ourselves down for two weeks, do you think this will solve the problem? So, Ralph, the reality is our, our whole point is to flatten the curve. If we all go out and start it, the curve goes up too high. That blows up the ICUs. That blows up the hospitals. It blows up the supplies. And if we flatten the curve by everybody just taking a step back and self-isolating or what do they call it uh, social distancing whatever it is um, that's going to help do you agree with that Leron? yes I mean in theory if everybody locked themselves for 14 days and then you got rid of it if you had it then yes of course but obviously that's in theory people are still going about their lives and going to work and going to places so people got to exactly food. who's delivering the food uh, there's yes. moving the food so that there's still some cross modulation but Fundamentally, if we self-isolate or a social distance, that's going to be helpful. It'll protect you and it'll protect your community, and it will help flatten the curve. Uh, let's see. You know, I read, I, read, I read an article that said, you know, if your employer tells you, you know, to work from home and you do that, but then at night you go out to a restaurant, you know, you kind of <laughs> undid, right, what you just did the whole day by staying at home. So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, it's um, – it's a matter of doing your best to, you know, wash your hands, sanitize, and not come into super close contact with other people. Yeah, by the way, for those keeping score at home, the, our old buddy Soap does the best job. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't worry about getting the fancy antibacterial stuff. Soap does the job. Uh, you know, that's, that's clear messaging from the, the experts. This is not me. I'm just repeating that. Uh, Zach talks about South Korea's promising – cutting the infection rate without something. And I saw Zach in the Zoom, but I don't see him there now. Uh, Luciana, if you are available, jump into the video, because I, I know you're such a traveler. I'm wondering what your experiences are. There you are. Good. Uh, yeah, there we go. Noches, uh, wherever you are. I don't know where you are. In Ecuador now. Ecuador. There you go. That's appropriate. Uh, tell us how this is impacting you. So for those who don't know, Luciana travels the world. She's always on the move. Have you seen an impact to you? Yes, of course. Um, we produce like many of our products actually in US, but like the components uh, from China, our best seller actually, we produce in China. Our supplier mentioned that about uh, people cannot go back to work and then they have to find new employees. So what I heard was because of course this happened kind of between Chinese New Year. So Chinese New Year, as we all know, the people go back to their families, so it's different provinces. Um, and then the coronavirus happened, and 
And then those workers could not go back to the factories because of those quarantine days. So our major supplier from like our best seller product, like he started hiring people like locally. And then our price, po- I mean, that's what they say, right? Yeah. But at least they, they are the only ones who are actually still providing some supplies for us in small quantities. We have massive orders. So we are breaking down the orders now to deliver like bit by bit, just not to run out of stock. Uh, and then they say that they found like local workers and then the other suppliers who do like components for like boxes and printing stuff, they still didn't get back to work. So I'm like literally looking for solutions in US now, like it's doubling the price, but we have yeah. to do what we have to do. That's the, uh, that's the word of the day uh, for your business. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, Zach summarizes the story, by the way, from South Korea. Infection rates dropping for fourth consecutive day without something like, uh, I don't know, isolation. So, Zach, if you do jump into the Zoom and you want to expand on that, happy to hear it. I do think that um, South Korea and Italy are, you know, good examples of kind of the developed world facing this thing head on. And we, we just hope that they, they have some success. So to talk about what Luciana referred to, one of the biggest problems is that in some cases, the factory workers aren't able to travel out of their own city yet. Um, even if they can travel when they get there, they face a 14-day quarantine period in the, the company dorms, and their temperatures check multiple times a day. They kind of have a very clear system. And again, this is where I think the Chinese government's are doing a good leadership role, uh, or at least an authoritarian role to go, this is how it's going to work. Uh, and that slows everything down. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We have um, a factory down in Malaysia, but it's owned by a Chinese firm. And they're two, two of the three top managers are from the Hebei province. So even though we have a facility in Malaysia that's ready to go, the two of the top three guys are not there. And that, of course, creates a problem for us <laughs> to, to do a, a proper production. The good news is the boss man is there, and uh, Lao Ban in Chinese is there. So uh, I'm sure they'll get going. But these personnel issues are not going to stop, and companies uh, – trying to find local workers and then train them up. It just slows it down. They're very good in general. China's very good at responding and being creative to these things. But I would tell you, now more than ever, before you is my free advice. So, you know, you get full refund on free. <laughs> Don't pay a, a, a deposit if you're not on terms until you have eyes on raw materials. So I'm talking about doing a pre-production inspection. I, I guarantee you, 99% of Amazon sellers have never done a pre-production inspection. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying you should do that. Spend the money. If you need a referral, go to simoglobal.com and get in touch with somebody there. They'll give you free referrals or go to Empower. They'll give you free referrals and get a pre-production um, inspection and get eyes on raw materials, eyes on the equipment's actually running and that they have people to run it. You you're go- saying, you're, Steve, you're saying they're taking a deposit, but they don't even have the raw materials. And who knows how long the production is going to take. Without question, that's going to happen. Not only that, there's going to be a bunch of factories that go out of business. Uh, One of the photo studios we use for our photos has already gone out of business in the last couple weeks. And these capital, short, especially smaller companies, they're going to fall by the wayside. uh, And and my concern is that people are going to have their deposits either tied up for a long time or lose them. And that was not something I would have said two months ago or three months ago. So do you think there's this consolidation that's going to happen across manufacturing in China where the big guys kind of stay in business and some of the smaller guys, uh, small little factories with, the, with you know, a few employees are, are going to be out of business? There definitely will be some consolidation, but I don't know how long it will last. It really depends if there, in fact, is a second outbreak and how long that lasts, in my opinion. And again, just so you know, all of this is just Steve – trying to divine the future. I have no idea. I'm not, uh, in yeah, but you're saying take, take precaution and make sure these factories are actually working in business, have raw materials before you send, you know, 10, 20, 30 grand deposits. Yeah. And, and the reality is they may quote, go out of business for one month, two months, six months. And then the Chinese government swoops in and cleans up some of the smaller guys. But the priority is on, uh, the top guys, right. And, and making sure the liquidity and the, cash flow and the resources are flowing at the top. So uh, all of these things are true realities. And by the way, I've seen these types of things happen in the 
um, you know, 28, uh, 2008 global meltdown, China faced a lot of pressure. Uh, 2013, 14, whatever SARS was hitting, uh, that also was a, a big deal. And so we see this kind of pattern repeat itself. So consider pre-production inspections, and then you should already be doing post-production inspections uh, to make sure the quality is there and all that stuff. And an inspection is like two, three hundred bucks, right? It'd be it'd be foolish yeah. to he to hear this information and and not do it. Right. And by the way, for those who say, "Well, I can't spend," you know, let's say it's two hundred bucks for the pre and two hundred bucks for the buy. I can't spend four hundred bucks on my shipment. It's like you, you know, take the risk if you, if you want. But if you can't build that into your margin, you're not doing it right. Uh, right. This is absolutely. And by the way. Whether you're a, a, a tiny person now, if you're if you're buying 200 units and it's an air shipment for 500 bucks, maybe you don't need to get caught up in so much uh, right. inspections. But if you're spending real money, every big company that I um, know and that I do business with, on down to the the smaller mid-sized companies, I'm talking about 50 to 100 million dollars. We all do this. There's no way you cannot do this, and, and particularly when there's pressure. So I, I tell people all the time, go read um, uh, Poorly Made in China. This gives you a framework of how uh, some um, cultural things work in China. By the way, it gives you insights. It's like reading 15 years of my life, uh, a heartbreak and all. And by the way, it's not about me. I have nothing to do with it. The author, Paul Midler, had his own independent experiences, but they're so consistent. Every situation in that book I've faced, and I want you guys to know, you can at least mitigate some of the risk if you follow and, my advice. And and are there any any additional things that, because of the current situation, sellers should be putting on the purchase orders, um, as far as like in writing, getting any any, you know, as far as like timelines for production and what are the potential penalties if they don't hit those timelines or what what advice or what should shall, sellers be doing in light of First of all, m most sellers aren't even putting any terms or anything on a on a purchase order. So that's number one, right? What happens if there's a failed inspection? Who pays for it? Who fixes it? But what about things like timelines and production time? And well, the, it, I, all of those are good questions, and there there's a series of things you should think about on your communication, your purchase order, uh, with your with your uh, manufacturer. First of all, there can be enforceable POs, um, and we've shared those with uh, Catalyst 88, we've shared them with Empowery, where you can mm -hmm. actually have terms written on your Chinese PO that make it enforceable. So uh, the name of the book, by the way, is Poorly Made in China. Uh, Zach uh, also gives his uh, thumbs up to it. Uh, it is really, yeah, Zach's right there. He's my uh, wingman there. So. <laughs> There's a bunch of things you should put in that PO. I would I always put don't deliver before, don't deliver after. We put in whatever terms that we've uh, agreed to or negotiated. Now's a great time to check your currency, make sure that you've adjusted for currency. Um, ask for terms and go, hey, every everybody's freaking out. I always blame the guy in the back room. The board of the directors is on me or the controller, mm -hmm. the auditor. Somebody's on me and I need your help. We've got to get terms on this thing. And I think China is trying to make liquidity in their local markets available. Um, if you've never heard of Sinosure, I guarantee your factory knows who they are. Sinosure will give export credit and right now they're really loose with that export credit. And what that means is the factory, not you, the factory goes to Sinosure and says, hey, will you give Luciana $50,000 or $100,000 or $500,000 worth of credit? And Sinosure, if you have one year of history of exports under that same company name, and um, yeah, decent volume, let's say above $100,000, um, and the higher the better, th that you are likely to get Sinosure to give you credit insurance. Credit insurance means that the Chinese factory, when they ship the product, Sinosure says, here's 80% of the money, or no, we guarantee up to 80% of the money, so the factory's only risking 20%. So sometimes you have to pay the 20%, sometimes they will take the risk with you, the, the point is, Sinosure exists. There's everybody who tells me there's no terms available in China. I go, well, the last two hundred million dollars that we've purchased, we didn't pay anything up front unless it was below ten grand. So let me just say, everybody who tells me what's not possible in China, 
I've already been there, done that. I'm tired of listening. So just get on board. And you don't have to be, a, I mean, I'm by far not the same size as you in purchasing. And I have terms with my supplier because I've developed a relationship and I ask for it. And so many sellers I feel like are never even asked or brought up the conversation. And now is a great time. There's so much uncertainty and the Chinese are hurting from it too that it's a great time to bring, bring up the conversation. Right, we need each other. And by the way, I, I consider this a very pragmatic and practical conversation. So if you need help with this, go to simoglobal.com. I think there's a negotiation um, engagement on there somewhere where my team will actually help you try to negotiate terms. We don't guarantee you'll get them because everybody's got their own credit, their own history and whatever, but at least we can engage the conversation. And I can tell you firsthand, People who have gone to China with us have walked away with $500,000 of free cash flow by getting terms, and, and that changes the complexion of your business. There's other things sellers can do. Um, first of all, I would be very careful with your cash, but that might mean it's a good time to go get some uh, additional funding, right? And empower has got a great program with sellers funding. You guys can go to empowery.com. Uh, or empowery.coop to find out the details there. Getting a little cash, you know, for, for your uh, war chest is not a bad idea. There's a bunch of things, and we'll probably cover this in the, in the coming days. This is really just kind of an ad hoc thing to say, you know, everybody pump the brakes on the panic. We don't have to panic. Let's be aware. As I like to say, awareness leads to, you know, kind of uh, informed decision making. And and then let's share best practices. You know, what are you guys doing? What are you finding effective? Luciana's already talked about packaging as a, as a trouble spot, but she's going to solve it. And by the way, Luciana, um, uh, check out the Empower. They've got a 3PL that can do packaging, like some sort of package thing right here in the U.S. And mm -hmm. uh, it may be a, a way to help you solve the problem. Even at a higher cost per unit up front, they're very fast. So they may be able to help you. Yeah, no, it's, it's not about like uh, bundling or putting together because my suppliers in US already do it. Um, it's actually the printing itself. <laughs> this one 3PL actually yeah. will design and print packaging on the fly. Oh, cool. Yeah, so uh, Empower can help you with that. Their name's Snapship or something like that. I can't remember, but they know mm -hmm. more about that. So, uh, the, you know, the, the, in that case, you should have them do some bundling containment right so they do all the bundling work and then there's some sleeve or some package that, that the uh, 3PL or your printer can make and then in the US have that uh, put on that's oh, my recommendation yeah. uh, Liron any other uh, words of wisdom here uh, no everything you said is, is spot on you know don't panic bad decisions are made in a state of panic you know um, think clearly and you'll get through this and uh, you know, focus on the important things. And, uh, you know, they say uh, you're watching X amount of minutes per day. You have a 27% uh, watching X amount of minutes of the news per day. You have a 27% ch uh, chance of having a worse day. So don't focus too much on the, on the bad news and, and focus on the things you can control. I think that's one minute of news is 27% yes. worse day and two minutes Seriously. is 50% worse. By the Seriously. time it's four minutes, it ain't great. Um, yes. Again, that doesn't mean we don't have to be informed. We should right. take note of things. The NBA, you know, suspending the season. Uh, you know, Germany saying, "Hey, no, nobody, no groups above 500 people." Uh, Italy saying, "Nobody in or out." All of these types of things should be factored in. Um, and then I, again, I th I think we all have a responsibility. I personally am canceling my my uh, travel, not because I'm scared uh, for myself, my own health, but I don't want to be part of the problem. Let's flatten that curve out and. You know, I, I'm not going to go hoard toilet paper per se, but I'll probably buy, you know, some supplies. And uh, yes. I, I don't know what the deal is with toilet paper. I still don't get that. But, uh, you know, I suppose at the point I actually need it, I'll, I'll have to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Luciana, what, what's your words of wisdom? And then we'll come to Margaret. Oh, my God. What can I say? I, th I think this is all like um, it's so massive, you know, like if we I, I just I don't hear much. I mean, I'm a traveler, so of course it affects myself because like I have to stop to travel a little bit as well. Like I, I literally just had booked like flights and accommodation in Israel and I have to cancel, right? Because like I just literally cannot go. 
anymore. I have a flight for uh, April 4th to Israel that is still up in the air. I don't know if the Europe ban includes Israel or doesn't include Israel at this point. Yeah, no, but like Israel has their own like uh, okay. rule right now. Okay. Like if you enter there, you have to do self quarantine yes. for fourteen it's, days. Period. It's in effect. It's in effect for the next two weeks. So I'm kind of waiting to see if if they lift that ban and if I can even go. Probably probably won't happen. But I was uh, just, uh, it's, it's, uh, great. I love it. Uh, and yeah, so it is impacting you. So what advice would you give to folks out there, Luciana? advice oh my god what would you say like i think this is i like to see positive points for everything that happens honestly like right now i'm trying to find suppliers i mean of course like it's affecting the whole world but i'm finding alternatives in india for example which i would never bother to go to because of the amount of work that we all have um so it, it, it creates opportunities as well so we have to be creative like to just go around things and then we discover new things so just like, just let's, you know, stay positive and um, we will go over it for sure. And let's use it for finding other solutions. Be creative. Yeah, I agree with that. Margaret, any uh, words there to share? Well, look, I think we've just got to all sort of stay positive and try and, you know, move forward. And I think if you sit around dwelling on this and listening to the news every day, it just drags you down. So I think we're, you know, our approach is going to be to try and, or keep everyone, um, you know, getting some products if we can, you know, manage to do it online and just, you know, try and help people through, especially people who are, you know, wanting and were intending to go and obviously find products for this Christmas from India. So that's our goal is to just try and work through that with everyone and find alternatives. Another thing I don't know whether you guys have found is the shipping, um, air shipping is costing a fortune at the moment, air freight. Yeah, so air freight is um, reliant on on uh, normal commercial flights, not just mm -hmm. cargo flights. And commercial flights have been slashed, so air the capacity is down. Mm -hmm. uh, once you know supply is down, prices go up. That's going to be a thing. And by the way, that's going to be a thing in container ships at some point for a number of reasons. Uh, so you know, I would highly recommend if you don't have a, a good freight forward again, and Powery's got a good freight forwarder they can share with you. They're not going to be able to break, um, you know, kind of economic realities, but they at least have pre-booked volumes that, that may have be at contract rates, at least for the ocean freight. Air freight's just kind of a, a commodity basis and you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. But yeah, that's happening. Yeah, so it's going to have a big, you know, a big effect on everyone's costs because, you know, they're looking, I think um, air freight was about three times yesterday what it normally is. So, I but mean, people, worse. you know, it's no point moving stock into Amazon and then going, oh, I need to charge double for this and not being able to achieve it. I mean, I think people need to take a step back as well and not just go, I've got to get this stock at any cost. I think because, um, you know, reality, your business decision's got to work out at the end that you've got enough money, you know, in the whole deal to sell because, you know, the, the community's not going to wear a double, you know, increase in, a, in every product. Um, just because of this, I know everything's going to go up. Wouldn't, TVs, et cetera, will go up. Sorry, Lorraine. Steve, wouldn't it be nice if Amazon came out and said, hey, for the next 30 days, we're cutting seller fees? <laughs> you know? I, I'm very good joke. Very good joke. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm they, surprised they haven't done some kind of proactive, um, you know, we're going to do our part. Uh, I, it is a joke, Luciana. Honestly, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a shame. I have so many friends at Amazon, but any seller that goes, Amazon thinks about sellers or Amazon thinks about uh, the seller's financial interest. I mean, I would, I, it would be nothing. Yeah. Dreamer joke. I mean, you guys can <laughs> react on Facebook. You can react uh, here on the zoom, but the, the reality is it is, it would be a very good PR move for them. And there's yes. only two things that move Amazon and that's uh, government, uh, press. The threat of government regulation and bad press. And yep. so it, they could get some good press here, maybe some goodwill and, um, well, they, they just put out that they're supporting local businesses in, in Seattle, I think, uh, with some money. That's that's good PR, right? They did yeah, that because, yeah. of, because of PR. Um, and I saw James Thompson uh, made a post on LinkedIn saying, like, well, what are, what are they doing for sellers? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I kind of, I kind of agree. And if they went ahead and, you know, cut some, cut some seller fees for 30 days, great PR move for what they're doing to help, you know, small business. Well, yeah, we'll see. I uh, Bill McDowell says dreamer, uh, and and All right, well. a little laughing, a laugh cry emoji. That's that's how serious Bill is. 
uh, Luciana yeah. also uh, pegged that right. You know, I, I think there's there will be things that happen that surprise us. And um, but Margaret's point, I, I want to drive this home. Each of you have to do very clear things to try to get your house in order. One is, for goodness sake, learn your landed cost of your product. I know how many of you guys, you tell me the FOB price, you're the X-Works price, and then you just kind of randomly say, <laughs> well, this is how much freight costs, but you don't actually know your duty, you don't know your tariff, you don't know the variance between some of these things, like the, sometimes the drage costs more and the containers cost more from shipment to shipment, or less for that matter. Know your landed cost, please. Um, uh, secondly, is get a really good pulse on your margin. Well, what's the true margin that you're selling at? How, you know, Amazon advertising costs, Amazon commission, FBA fees, third party fees, any other shipping uh, once it's inland. Please know this stuff. And I've said this for years it's the difference between those that kind of just survive and, and are just turning over revenue and those who kind of build a business that has equity and, and ultimately creates wealth is those who understand their numbers and those who get their business under control. Uh, Leron posted about Amazon doing another review sweep, and I think we all want you know, the, the uh, naughty players to be swept out, right? We don't want fake reviews, we don't want that, but we know that Amazon paints with a broad, broad brush when, they, when they, their algorithms are not so precise. So um, I've recommended, you know, go to parsimony.com, get the free, um, review download or get the free alerts and, and at least understand what your situation is so that you can, uh, and there's limitations, right? You can't do a thousand items uh, every two hours or every two minutes, but it, they'll download the reviews, they'll download and, and catalog your pages and show you when things get hijacked. And the, the most frustrating thing is when you tell Amazon, hey, I lost 500 reviews and they were legit reviews, what's up? And they go, oh, what reviews did you lose? Like we're supposed to tell them, well, we can tell them because we have them all cataloged and you should too. Um, archiving that stuff and having alerts is important and I don't know, free is a pretty good price. So uh, Baptiste uh, says something. Um, it is safe to say Amazon and other corporations are just something. Tiptoeing uh, their turf at the moment. It would be fab to get some slack from them though. Yeah, so he likes your idea. I think everybody's on board with the idea. You can give a big thumbs up if you like the idea. All right, just just email 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 me and, and copy Jeff at Amazon. Yeah, mostly. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> next time I run into him in an elevator, I'll be sure to bring this. <laughs> hey, yes, you, you'll you'll bring it up next time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did actually run into Jeff in an elevator uh, about a year ago, I reckon. Uh, Christian says maybe we're thinking from the entrepreneurial point of view. Amazon's a listed company, never going to happen. Frankly, uh, Amazon and every other listed company uh, will have, they'll be called to account, not just for profitability, but what are they doing to help the situation? Mm -hmm. And let's not, let's not forget, Luciana talked about what's the positive sides. E-commerce is the best place you can be right now. Mm -hmm. Besides day-to-day -day food, right, which we all are going to have to have, there's kind of that day-to-day -day food and you know, kind of keeping the electricity on, those types of things. We're going to do just like everybody else is going to do, which is go online and try to figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. When you look at the stock market getting killed, the stuff that's going to recover are things like Amazon, Netflix, all the things that, you know, are, are good for nesting. So as you start thinking about those things, I would also give you kind of this parting wisdom. Or I, I branded it wisdom, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> that way you, you know it's really good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> My, my thoughts are you should start thinking as you consider product introductions and things like that, what are people going to want to buy? Not as a fad, right? I, I'm not suggesting going out and buying sanitizer, buying masks or any of that stuff. I, I think that's, that's going to be a, a, a fidget spinner kind of curve. But think about what people need long term that they might really need now, but they will, they will see a need later. I, true behaviors are going to change. Our sourcing behaviors are likely to change. Like I have people on the ground in India, I have people on the ground in Malaysia, Vietnam, China, and we're, we're scouring. We also have our computer screens up and we're looking all around the world uh, for stuff. Behaviors are going to change and we have to think about how our consumer behavior is going to change. And uh, so really consider that as you think about bringing out products. Uh, 
I'll let anybody on Facebook ask questions before we sign off. Uh, uh, let's see, I'll start for Margaret. Margaret, any uh, final thoughts there? No, look, I think it's just something we're going to have to wear through and hopefully, well, what I'd, you know, it worries me is that long term, you know, how much time is it going to take for this to swing back? I mean, you know, with Amazon, uh, we've still all got our costs. We've still got, you know, our businesses to run. But as people run out of stock, what's going to happen with Amazon down, you know, in six months' time? Because there's a lot of people obviously not placing orders at Canton this year or wherever. Um, so where's all that stock going to come from? So is Amazon going to fall into a slump too? Like is it going to be, you know, they're so big, but the bigger they are, the harder they fall sometimes too because if, you know, there's half the people only putting stock into Amazon, that's going to have a big effect on Amazon as well. Well, that supply side is definitely going to be a bit of a problem. Uh, but I, I suspect it's going to be a general, let's call it a, a three to six month problem, not a, a long, long term problem, even if this thing gets nuts for the next two years. Um, and, and the reality is that's, that's really good advice. I would say this, if you're selling like luxury, um, sunglasses, those are going to be less of a hot item right now than some kind of home nesting thing, right? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to throw out names cause I, I don't want to send somebody down the wrong path, but there's <laughs> a lot of things out there that people are going to be using and, uh, uh, Constantine asks, uh, any like, uh, Steve, for, for example, I saw an article about, uh, you know, this company that was on Shark Tank soapbox mm -hmm. that you can disinfect and clean your cell phone with, right? There you go. Probably booming right now. Right. Because that's something people are thinking about. Yeah. And they make, that's one of those behaviors that may change long term, right? Mm -hmm. I, to me, it's shocking how many people are like, oh, we should wash our hands. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, wash your hands. <laughs> um, I'm washing them more than I normally do. I'll admit that. Uh, but often when I go to the bathroom, I'll still wash my hands. Uh, nobody had to tell me that. But that behavior, disinfecting your phone or your toothbrush or whatever, I think those things could uh, uh, be on the on the incline. Or uh, there's Colin. How are you, Colin? <clears throat> Before we go to you, Colin, uh, I want to just uh, Constantine ask: Are there any sites you would recommend for sourcing outside of China? So the reality is. Uh, there's lots of ways to source outside of China. You you can still start with Alibaba and filter outside of China. You can search for OEM in a particular country if you have a, an instinct that they're there. One of the problems, even going outside of China, and people don't fully understand this, is if the core raw materials still come from China, you're not really saving anything. In fact, you may be taking longer and, and creating more problems for yourself. So uh, Panjiva or Jungle Scout or any of those guys that, that have some of those import databases, Go check out the HS code, do a reverse search, do an ASIN search, do a reverse. Uh, right now, I have my team vetting 2,000 suppliers, Amazon's top 1,300 suppliers and Target's top 1,000 suppliers. And we're just vetting them to see what they have and if they're able to do stuff. And those are from all around the world. Um, and uh, we may even share that list. Would, would any, I can't give that list away for free because we're spending – you know, thousands of uh, dollars and countless hours putting together the contact info and stuff. But does anybody want Amazon's list of suppliers with the contact info? Does that matter? Or, I mean, you can make that list yourself. Uh, same with Target. We got we have the Target suppliers. Uh, a list of 2,000, let's say 60% of them will have contact info. Do we care? Does anyone, do you care, Leron? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's something that uh, I would like to look at. Uh, I think you've, posted it before i posted it with no contact info and that's the that's the key yeah. difference right and people can go google that stuff themselves but we're not just googling we're reaching out they put stuff in our system uh yeah. tells us products and, and a whole vetting process yeah i think there's i think there's interest in that okay margaret any comments before we jump to colin no i don't think so i'm pretty okay margaret's good uh colin you want to say hi hey hi guys how you doing everyone there he is. Uh, any uh, words? I don't know if you just joined us, uh, Colin, but we're uh, we're just wrapping up now. But uh, happy to have you here. And if you want to add something, you're welcome. But yeah, I mean, uh, we we all. So since we know, since we noticed this one, uh, these things with China has been happening for a while for us. Like going in a product, and then people know about product. Um, go, go, no, no more than our product profitability. 
um, the China China manufacturers would know more more than us actually. So and then from that point, 2017, I started diversifying our manufacturing process. So now we have like a three manufacturer for each and every product what we what we sell in Amazon right now. So we have one in Pakistan, one in India, and one in uh, uh, China as well. So now we completely balanced out. So one of the product what we have right now we procured from uh, uh, Taiwan. So the only one thing what I would tell people is right start looking for people who have the who have the basic procurement capacity of uh, material. If they have the basic procurement uh, uh, material capacity, they should be able to do any product that you want actually. So that's the point that we are at right now. So we put up a sourcing team in India right now um, to help uh, multiple people who can diversify their uh, uh, product, uh, um, different products from different country actually. Yeah, I think that's an important point and, and one that I'll drive home as we bring it to a close everybody. So first of all, thanks for the feedback on the Facebook. Um, I'm not sure if we'll release that list or not because it's it literally hundreds of hours have gone into it and we have lots of automations and uh, we actually, those suppliers get inquiries from our computer and then they have to go enter the stuff in our computer uh, and it's, uh, it's a pretty sophisticated system. But if we do choose to share it, um, there would be some cost to it, just to be clear. So Colin's point about having redundancy in manufacturing I like it even outside of China if they have the raw materials. I think that's an important point. But even inside of China, having that redundancy is probably a prudent step to take at this point. Um, and and I know I'm going to hear a bunch of stories from people talking about, oh no, I'm I'm really good friends with my supplier. Their kids came over and they stayed with me, and we're, we're like brothers. He calls me brother, right? There's a bunch of these emotional nonsense stories. I know you believe it, and it's even fine even if it's true. And I have some great friends there, and I've been doing business in China for very close to 20 years. But almost all of that is subterfuge and nonsense. Um, you should treat a supplier with a professional um, disposition and professional expectations, but don't wrap up the emotions as like, oh, you know, uh, you know, just because their kid came and stayed with you or you stayed with them or you broke bread with them. That doesn't change the, the complexion of a business deal. So be pragmatic and be reasonable. And I'm not saying you shouldn't apply intangible human touch points to a deal, but I'm saying you don't just have one supplier that you're in love with and you stay with them forever. And I'll tell you, I've shared this with Leron and others. I had a supplier for 10 years. We were their number one customer. We did three to $4 million a year with this supplier and they were perfect. I never had an inspection, maybe one inspection failed over 10 years. Uh, we had no problem with them. Any issue, they would take care of it 100% and they pulled a fast one on us 10 years into the deal. That is a multi-million dollar problem for me. And it's a, it's a patent dispute, I won't go into the details. The point is, everybody who says they have deep relationships and this and that, I gave that guy you know, 30 to $40 million over 10 years. We were very close, we're still close. I still like the guy. But he made a choice to save himself eighty thousand dollars. That was the, the the chicanery that was pulled. And now I have a multi-million dollar potential liability. So my point is there is no time that you should ever let your guard down, no matter where you're doing business. This is not about China specifically or any country. Just don't let your guard down. You have a fiduciary duty to your shareholders, even if that's just you, to take care of business and get the job done right. So don't, uh, again, I, I grow tired of the emotional stories. Treat it like a business and it will be like a business. Colin, you want to add to that or subtract? Yeah, so I had a multiple incident like that. One of the time, like uh, my supplier said, they, can, they are sick and then they cannot do anything right now. So <laughs> since I had like one, two months of stock um, and then I was able to survive and then find a different manufacturer, able to pull the different things. So from that point, I decided that, you know what, I'm going to have a multiple manufacturer for for product actually that's that's really really needed um, so even if the next is going to be a Pakistan or India now I have supplied in China and now we're looking into Bangladesh and all of the country actually yeah so, that's good. I, I think that's the right choice we have stuff in uh, Malaysia Vietnam and Thailand to some extent and and that's expanding and by the way I'm agnostic I've done stuff in Portugal Ukraine you know all over the world South America I, I don't really care Manufacturing is a commodity. I want them to have raw materials. I want them to have talent, machinery, 
you know, quality and will, of course, validate all of that stuff. But I don't really care where it comes from. And that's In a, a fact, big, they yeah. have a they have a better pricing and also they have a better skills actually, but they don't have the opportunity. I have a lot of buy, se, uh, the manufacturers here who don't have the 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 sellers actually from US. They usually send it to um, Europe and Australian country. They don't have a better connection to the U, US market actually. So they're literally looking for people who need the a thing and also they're ready to compromise the pricing and quality and anything that they want actually. Yeah, I, I definitely think that. Uh, it looks like my bandwidth, which is a one a fiber optic, one gigabit, uh, and goes on and off. Uh, Seth asked that there be a recording. I, I think Facebook will have it there. Um, and if not, I have it in the Zoom, and I'll post it on awesomers.com podcast here shortly. So, again, Colin makes a very fine point. I, I want everybody to know there's a lot of moving parts here. So I want you to think of it as a giant puzzle, right? You don't even know what the puzzle is. You don't know if it's a landscape. You don't know if it's a a wildlife picture, you don't know if it's under the ocean, you don't know what it is, but you got to put all the puzzles down and then you start putting it together as you go. There, Nobody can give you all the answers. I certainly cannot. And I've been doing this awful long time. My advice to you is be pragmatic, be thoughtful. If you're confused, if you're nervous, talk to your colleagues, talk to your friends, not in person, probably do a, a conference like this. Stay in touch with folks like Lee, Ron, and Colin, and uh, Margaret, and, and uh, you know, I'm going to be jumping online more. We're going to start doing more online kind of hangouts or masterminds uh, just to give people an outlet. Because I love to network. I love to see people. But it's not as practical right now. So we're going to have to shift our behaviors. So, um, okay. You're welcome, Seth. Uh, oh, he says it's wisdom. So now I've proclaimed a wisdom and I've got a second there. And maybe even Baptiste said it was wisdom. So that's three wisdom guarantees right there. Three uh, wise men. Right there. I, feel, I feel like that quota of wisdom has been given. So thanks, everybody, for joining. I know there's a lot of you coming in and out. Um, Facebook should have it, and I'll post it later on uh, Osmer's podcast. Uh, if I do put this stuff on Osmer's.com podcast pretty frequently, it's a free thing. By the way, if you go to Osmer's, you join that mailing list, you get a bunch of free stuff. Um, a free SOP on finding your why, free SOP on your company why, a bunch of stuff for like 12 weeks. And uh, again, that's all free. So, Colin, say say good night, everybody. All right, guys. Good night. Yeah. Take it care. may be daytime for you, Margaret. Say say hello and goodbye. There she goes. She's waving, everybody. That was a silent wave for you, Facebookers. Uh, Lee, Ron, any uh, final words and a shout out? Um, no, thank, thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. Everything you do for you know the seller community and uh, you know for the discussion, I think it's uh, helpful. Yeah, well, you know, I love entrepreneurs and uh, I love awesomers. So uh, thank you guys. Stay the course, be calm, and stay tuned. There's more coming. By the way, the, the news and the situation will get way worse, way worse before it gets better. So anticipate that. And then think about what that means for your business, your day-to-day -day life, and then you'll be better prepared. So uh, thanks, Baptiste. Thanks, Loretta. Everybody who said thanks, I couldn't see y'all. We'll see you guys next time. And uh, be safe out there and uh, also be awesomer. See you all later.